How's it going? Hey, Matt, how are you? I am good. Bob Costa, thank you for, uh, I guess, filling in today for our good friend, Bill Scher, who is out on paternity leave. Um, Great news for Bill. Yeah. Now, I think everyone knows you, uh, but uh, I guess for those who who don't, I know you've done this a few times, but tell us just a little bit about you. Sure. I report on politics for National Review Magazine and National Review Online, but mainly for our blog, The Corner. I cover Congress, the White House, but for the past six, seven months, I've really been focused on the 2012 presidential campaign, and I've been on the trail going to Iowa, New Hampshire, Florida, South Carolina. It's been a, a long but fun journey. Uh, and I've been with National Review for now for about two and a half years. Wow. And everyone, of course, I'm Matt Lewis with The Daily Caller. Um, for those who are just tuning in. <laughs> just tuning in. Um, so well, let's talk. I, I want to talk later about you and being on the trail and the whole process. But I guess let's start just talking politics. And obviously on Tuesday we've got Michigan and Arizona. And then looking a little bit further ahead, Super Tuesday. Um, but so, how important do you think the debate was, and and how do you what are you looking to see on on this coming Tuesday? I think it was an important debate mainly because Mitt Romney did not let Rick Santorum surge ahead. I think Santorum had to have a big moment, and it was just a tough setting, sitting around a table, Charlie Rose style. No one really had a great night. It was very peevish most of the time, and how they handled different questions. I don't think Santorum or Romney when they tangled with each other elevated uh, their campaigns. Uh, but Santorum didn't have any real breakaway uh, moment in that debate. So I think going to the final weekend before Michigan especially and Arizona, Romney's in a very strong position. He's closing in the polls. Santorum has had a bump these past few weeks, but Romney just with having the one debate, having some strong ads, a lot of money pouring into these states, he looks like he has a good ground game and a good chance of winning. But at the same time, we saw what happened on February 7th, what happened in Colorado, Missouri, Minnesota. You never want to count him to him out. The other thing that's not getting enough attention, I think, is Gingrich had a great debate. Now, we can all yeah. chuckle and say, hey, look, Newt does better when he's not at the top of the polls. But he had a solid debate. He reinforced his images, the ideas, man of the party. He was even, as he said, quote, cheerful. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was one of the best lines of the night. I mean, for Gingrich to say he's cheerful. And then Romney to say resolute just reinforces Romney's image as having just a, a problem with language. He's, he's a little awkward in his persona. He can't connect in many ways. Uh, but Gingrich was great. I don't know if that translates into wins in Tennessee and Georgia for Gingrich on Super Tuesday. But again, with Sheldon Adelson pouring cash into Gingrich's coffers, at least through the Super PAC, can't count Newt out at this point. So let me ask this question. You mentioned Georgia, and this is something I probably just need to Google. Um, why does Georgia, Georgia's like delegate rich? And I know that some of the early states like Florida were penalized by 50% of their delegates, that's right. and that's why. But is there, is, is, is it just me or does it seem like Georgia maybe has more delegates than I would than I would naturally assume? Yeah, because Georgia's one of the only states this year that's not trying to redo uh, the calendar. They're not messing around with their date. Uh, they're really just staying in place as the, I think the RNC has always wanted Georgia to be on Super Tuesday. And so they're keeping their full delegate count. And you're right, it's, it's, it's odd when you look at the delegates. You say Florida, 50, and, 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 and Georgia has much more. Uh, but I think this is important for Newt. It really makes Georgia more of a, a must-win for Newt politically. Right. Because it, and, and especially considering, rich. you know, the uh, the embarrassment. If, if, you know, obviously if Romney loses Michigan, it's a big deal. And if, if Newt loses Georgia, that's it's a cool outdoor thing all over. And I think it's even a little bit more important for Gingers to win Georgia than Romney to win Michigan. I think Romney has the organizational, institutional, financial strength to weather a bad Michigan and go into Super Tuesday and far deep into the spring as a, a top contender for the nomination. Whereas if Gingrich fizzles in Georgia and, and he doesn't have a southern block to help boost him back into the top tier, I'm not sure where he goes. So you mentioned the February 7th contest. I'm here, I'll am here. i give you my, my sort of take on, on this and you tell me if you if you disagree. Um, Santorum yeah, obviously had a huge night February 7th and I think if Michigan had been a week later, 10 days later, even two weeks later, <laughs> Santorum would have won Michigan. But it's hard to like it's hard to beat money and organization, the two things that Romney has. 
and you can't do it. You can do it for a while, but it's hard to beat it for three or four weeks. And it's sort of like Bill Belichick. You know, you give that guy an extra week, a bye week to prepare, it's really hard to beat him. And I think that's how Robbie's team is. Like, it's just a, a weird fluke of the of the schedule that Rex Santorum's momentum had to sustain for, like, nearly a month. You're right. You know, this reminds me of a, an interesting moment in the campaign. Right after Santorum was Iowa in early January, his campaign felt they had to go to New Hampshire to compete nationally. But remember, there was less than a week between the Iowa caucuses and New Hampshire primary. And so Santorum was really scrambling, didn't have an organization in New Hampshire, and Romney was able to really boost himself uh, in, in win New Hampshire. And, and Santorum, I think the, the calendar is just something you have to deal with. I think Santorum, in some ways, though, even with the organization limitations and the financial limitations, Santorum, I don't think, he, he won Colorado, Missouri, and Minnesota, not because he had a better organization in many ways, but because he had a better message. He was connecting. He was the Romney alternative that had buzz. So I think this is his path ahead. He knows he can't compete in every single facet of the campaign with the Romney machine, uh, but if he has a strong blue-collar manufacturing message of eliminating the corporate tax of manufacturers, a family-friendly tax proposal, uh, and, and reducing, tripling, excuse me, the personal deduction for children in, in his tax plan, and he also has this conservative uh, firebrand reputation, he thinks he can move, maybe move ahead. But it's interesting when you look at the latest cash on hand figure, Santorum struggling. He's not there with Romney. And I just think if he doesn't have momentum at right coming out of Super Tuesday or at least a strong Michigan, I think Romney's going to put this one away. At least he, he could. Well, you mentioned uh, Santorum's policies, which, I mean, you know, if from a free market standpoint, I have problems with those policies. Sure, he picks but, and losers. Exactly. But as a political analyst, I think it's really smart, and it really separates him from the pack. I mean, he is very much taking a sort of conservative populist message. He's the only guy who has that message. Um, my question is, and, uh, and it may just be that I'm watching it from a national perspective, and, and the targeting in Michigan may, may be different, but is he pushing that enough? Like, is is he is his message sharp enough? Do the, does the average person... No know that he has this manufacturing uh, plan. I think, I think you and I are the only ones to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem, right? Right. I mean, Santorum, he goes to the Detroit Economic Club uh, a couple days ago, and he gives a big speech about his pro-manufacturing, blue-collar, I come from western Pennsylvania, grandson of a coal miner speech. Yet he does it extemporaneously. And I think this says a lot about Santorum's his appeal and perhaps his stumbling in how he's not connecting with his, his message is because he gave it extemporaneously. He didn't even release a transcript from the campaign. And so there was no news story about this Detroit Economic Club speech about Santorum going into Michigan and talking about manufacturing. Santorum has been constantly, this past week, distracted by social issues. He's been dragged into the media wars over contraception and other things. And so Romney goes to the Detroit Economic Club this week on Friday, today, and what, what happens is it major news stories. Page one, most papers, at least the political press, Romney's going to Michigan, his home state. He's framing this as the key part of his campaign. He's, he's um, unleashing his tax plan, 20% cut across the board on all individual rates. Yet Santorum, we don't hear much about his, his manufacturing plan. And I think you're right, in the Rust Belt, especially where the recessions uh, plagued the entire region, Santorum really has connected. I, I saw this in Iowa. Why Santorum was connecting was he was railing against, uh, you know, Romney for not really uh, addressing the manufacturing problem in the country. And I, and I think on an economic level, I would very much agree with you that it has big problems by picking winners and losers, by giving uh, a big break to manufacturers. Because what happens, a lot of economists say, the minute you have an exemption, corporate tax elimination for manufacturers, uh, what happens in the country? Every single company becomes a, quote, manufacturer. They want that tax break. And yeah. uh, it, it may not be a perfect situation. But you're right, the politics of it are very interesting. But you're right. I, I think Santorum, though, it's, a, it's a, a question of discipline. I think he's a great campaigner. He's one of the best on the stump. He holds these long, sprawling town hall meetings. Uh, but in terms of reinforcing his economic message, it just hasn't been there. And I think it's because he, he, he viscerally wants to engage on the social issues. And I respect him for that. And he, he's a true believer. It, it's real. But at the same time, it dominates in a, in a presidential campaign. You can't let one side of the spectrum dominate your discussion. Yeah. And, and, and I think I, 
I'll paraphrase myself something I wrote, which is that Santorum, that what this shows is that Santorum may be a very, very good human being and a very bad politician. Um, well, I don't know if he's a bad politician. I mean, think about it, right? He wins in 94 in Pennsylvania statewide. He wins in 2000 statewide in Pennsylvania. So he, if, if you look up on that stage, what do you see? You see a congressman, Ron Paul, from Texas. He's the only one in a House seat. Great, but he's, it's a House seat. He hasn't won statewide. You see Newt Gingrich. He's only won a, a seat in Georgia. And you see Mitt Romney, who won one term in Massachusetts and decided not to run for re-election in 2006. You get Santorum, who runs in 94, in 2000, wins uh, statewide in a, a real purple state, wins in a tough Democrat district in western Pennsylvania in 98, 92. And then 2006, a horrible year for Republicans, yes, he loses by 18 points. But he's the only person on that stage who has won real tough statewide races more than once. That's a very good point, and although I think the problem is you've just expressed it more eloquently than he has. Um, so, but, I, but that, that's that's true. You're absolutely right. And I think so. I think you're hitting on something right there. Why, why is he talking about his electability? Because not only is he talking about social conservative issues, it seems constantly, which is fine. It has its place, especially in a Republican primary. Uh, and I think there should be a good debate on those issues. But it's too much, often for Santorum. At least he takes the media bait in talking about these things constantly. But he also saw. I mean, maybe you disagree with me here. I think he took Romney's bait in the debate by uh, talking too much about his record, being acting like he was in the Senate cloakroom debating past votes yeah. and minutia. I mean, you had, where was his turning back, his pivot back to the economic right. things? I didn't see that. I, I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's the fundamental problem is um, the refusal to, to stay on message and to carry questions. And I'll say, like, uh, a couple things. One, in terms of the social issues, I don't think it's. I don't think there's a problem talking about social issues. I think the problem is you need to frame the social issues. So, for example, I think poverty is a social issue. I think defending the right to life is a social issue. And if you talk about those, you win. If you talk about uh, wanting to jail abortion doctors and contraception, you probably lose. So it's not a matter of trying to not talk about social issues. It's a matter about talking about them in the right manner, uh, and I think a, a, a manner that's winning. And I would also argue more representative of Santorum's actual world view. But he he has this, um, he, I think he thinks it's dishonorable to duck a question, especially one that, that goes to a core value. So he ends up spending the majority of his time playing defense, allowing the questioner to control his message rather than controlling himself. And again, I'm not saying he has to just always pivot to manufacturing, right. although I think he right. should do that more. And that's part of the appeal feels that he talks about right. things uh, in a free-flowing fashion, that he's not, he's off the cuff. I mean, I think Romney's probably too far to the extreme of being too disciplined. Romney never seems to engage, never really takes peppered questions from the press, doesn't ever have to send anything off message, but maybe he could use a little more levity sometimes, whereas Centaur probably is a little too unplugged. Right, I think that's true. So look into Michigan. I think I think you I think you've implied uh, that you think Romney will probably win. Yeah, four or five points. Four or five. Oh, right, four or five points. So not even necessarily that close. Well, that's that close, but not close. Close. I, I think Romney. Is that a gut feeling, or, or do you have? Well, I mean, reason? just looking at the polls. Yeah, I'd say it's a probably quarter polls, quarter talking to uh, people on the ground there, quarter to talking to other pollsters, and quarter gut. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think part of it, the gut part, is just because Santorum didn't have a strong bait. Right. I think that going into the weekend, where now it just becomes get out the vote, there's no buzz about Santorum. And Romney's going to have a lot of attention on his economic plan. He was smart to do it today, Friday, uh, because this whole weekend paper, Detroit News, is all going to be about Romney's Friday speech. And Romney's, that's a very appealing, catchy tax plan. And it's been touted by almost every supply side type as a relatively pro growth, not perfect but relatively pro-growth, supply-side-friendly proposal. So uh, I tend to think you're right. I mean, we could all be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised to be surprised. But if I am if I had to bet, I would bet that Romney will win Arizona and Michigan. And then I think that means, like, once again, he's dodged this bullet, right? I mean, Romney has had opportunities. He, he's sort of – he's missed opportunities to become – the front runner, but he's also missed opportunities to become an also-ran. And um, 
you just you can't close the deal, but you also can't knock him off his pedestal. And I think once again, Romney will have been sort of staring at the abyss, and he will have come back. And if he wins Michigan and Arizona, then I think, um, well, well, I'll ask you what what do you think that would mean? If he wins Michigan, if Romney wins Michigan, Arizona, yeah, I think Romney goes into Super Tuesday, and he fends off a Santorum surge in some of the Midwest states and Idaho. Uh, in Oklahoma, and then Gingrich could come in and maybe do well in Tennessee, but in Georgia. Now, St. Torrance going to have to look to the South and try to compete with a fading Gingrich in the South if he has a bad Super Tuesday, because he's going to need some other states some, to buffer him to try to boost him back into this race. The other question, though, that I have for you is this. So we, we all think about St. maybe not having a great February 28th, uh, maybe going to the Super Tuesday with not as much energy as he had hoped. Suppose it's the opposite. Suppose the Antoine surprise is just like he did earlier in February. And what's Romney's great class scenario? I mean, what, is, what happens now if Santorum has now won almost all of the February contests? Maybe Romney slips ahead in Arizona. But if Romney loses his home state, what goes on? What, what happens in the party? So I, I, think, uh, I think Michigan is huge. And I, I, I think the difference is, my guess would be, if Romney wins Michigan, then he probably finds a way to win the nomination before the convention, get the 1144 delegates. If Romney doesn't win Michigan, then I think it's more likely he still leads in the delegate count, but goes into the convention without the requisite number to clinch the nomination. That's, that's kind of where I see it. I think it's very important for that reason, but um, what do you think? I, I still have a feeling, though, that if Romney loses Michigan, it, it means not that Santorum's being crowned the victor, but rather it's just a wide open race. I still don't see when I, you and I do the same thing every day. We talk to Republican officials, Republican strategists, conservative activists, and I just don't see a coalescing around Santorum. I see some very big concerns about Romney, uh, but I don't see a movement towards Santorum and embrace of Santorum. There's respect towards him, but he still has to prove himself in many ways as a national candidate as someone who can even win a primary. And, and so I think it just becomes, as you say, maybe a long slog toward Tampa. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think if Romney wins Michigan, it's still not going to be, um, he, you know, he's not going to be coronated. But I think if Romney wins Michigan, he sort of becomes, again, the de facto front runner. He'll probably find a way to win. Um, but if not, I agree with you. If, if, if Santorum wins Michigan, I don't think Santorum becomes the front runner. I think then it sort of fractures into a regional campaign where Gingrich dominates the South, Santorum dominates the Midwest, and Romney everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be, that's where you end up with uh, the uh, contested slash broker convention. What about for VP? Who do you oh, like? this is interesting. Well, um, so two things have happened, and <laughs> at least two things have happened in the past couple of days that I think uh, somewhat impact this, right? So you've got McKay Coppin's story over at BuzzFeed about right, right. Marco Rubio having grown up a Mormon, um, which is interesting. And then uh, you've got the story, I guess I was the first national guy to pick up on it, but it's really a, a Kentucky media outlet who uh, talked to Rand Paul and uh, or interviewed Rand Paul, and, and, and Rand Paul said he would be honored to be vice president, to be selected as, as Romney's running mate, which fueled more speculation uh, because of, of Ron Paul's sort of weird uh, symbiotic relationship with Mitt Romney. Uh, <laughs> so, but I mean, which, which of those two, not like, do you think either of those two stories will impact the? Uh, of the beep race at all? I, I think the Kay Coppin story was a great scoop, but I still believe Rubio is in the hunt if Romney is the nominee for the, for the number two slot. This country is beyond saying we can't have a Mormon uh, in Mitt Romney and a, a former Mormon on a ticket. This is America. And I think as much as we want to talk about ticket balancing or all this, Rubio says he's a devout conservative Roman Catholic. He also attends that.
Hello? Hey, sorry, I guess we got disconnected. It's okay. Uh, you want to just want to keep it rolling, or do you want to start? Yeah, I'm still recording you. I'm still recording. Let's. Rock All right. Uh, let's just pause and I'll start. <laughs> up. So I think Marco Rubio is still in the hunt for the number two slot because look, you have a Mormon on the top of the ticket and a former Mormon. This is America. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. This is the country's not going to wag its finger or political pundits shouldn't say that's not a balanced ticket now. I think Rubio still brings a lot uh, with his roots. Uh, with his, his story, his, his ability to articulate uh, a freedom message. I think it, it resonates with a lot of people. He's a conservative star in the U.S. Senate. He's, do, he's done a lot of good work now on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's still on the hunt. The, the BuzzFeed story is interesting, uh, but it doesn't rule them out. Uh, Rand Paul, Rand Paul is one of the most ambitious, friendly guys in the Senate. Uh, doesn't have a lot of friends in terms of uh, being a clubby guy, but he has a lot of respect from his colleagues. He's considered very smart. One of the first things he did when he got the Senate is master that rule book. And you know what? I think if you're Mitt Romney, you can't rule anything out at this point. You may not want to pick Rand Paul, a freshman libertarian senator from uh, Kentucky. But if you want if you want those uh, Ron Paul supporters to sit home in November, or you want them to be out as part of your ground game, I think you'd much prefer the latter. It may not take a Ron or Rand Paul in the number two slot to get right. there. But I think it's well, what, uh, I think the, the thing that sort of makes this... Uh, all, all that's true, but I think the thing that makes the Rand Paul thing even more interesting is the notion that Mitt Romney could show up in Florida at the convention with, you know, a thousand delegates needing a couple hundred. And that's when Ron Paul will have a tremendous amount, potentially could have leverage, um, presumably, you know, for some sort of... Oh, that would be fascinating. Ron Paul... That'd be something... <laughs> I mean, Ron Paul brokering a deal to put his son on it. I mean, he couldn't write that better. I mean, Ron uh, it's unbe this whole race has been amazing, but like if that happens, unbelievable. And then in terms of the Rubio thing, I agree with you uh, that, number one, I agree with you. I think Marco Rubio is by far the most exciting, eloquent, interesting politician, let alone Republican elected in, in the past uh, decade. At least as far as we know about, so there might be somebody out there that you know, I won't even know what he's talking about. Um, and I also agree with you, I don't think the Mormon thing hurts him. But what about the secrecy? This is the part that I think is interesting. I mean, so, like recently, you know, a couple months ago, the, the story that, you know, Rubio's parents actually came over during the Batista era, not Castro. Um, that was somewhat of a surprise to a lot of people. Um, I think there's a very good explanation. You know, it's, it's not indictment on him. Um, they were fleeing one dictator. Then when they got here, another dictator took over. They couldn't go back. So they were sort of refugees in the sense they couldn't return to their home country. Um, but it was still seen as a little bit interesting, something that sort of we didn't know. And, and now this, like the public is just now learning about this. And isn't it, isn't that the bigger issue that, that like, what's the next thing we're going to find out about? It's a complicated question. I think Senator Rubio has not been secretive. He, I don't think he's been hiding things. He's rather just been private. I know we all want full disclosure about everyone, every part of every public figure's life. Uh, but I, I have a, a respect for at least him trying to not have everything out there. Because is it the business of everyone to know everything about your U.S. Senator? Perhaps someone can make that argument. Uh, but it, I think he was going to talk about this in his upcoming memoir, The American Son. This is something that he, it was a faith he participated in. It was 8 to 13. And any faith experience, I think, is nothing to be ashamed of or worry about having to share either. It's, it's no one else's business. Uh, he, and I don't think he was ever hiding from it. I don't think he's lied about it. He rather just didn't talk about it. And so that, to me, says he's a private guy. Uh, and, and I respect that. And I don't think it, it should be a huge issue. Uh, I think more important about Marco Rubio is that he represents the Tea Party, and he was a, he doesn't like that term, of course. He doesn't like to be called a Tea Party senator. But for someone like Mitt Romney, who needs to add the Tea Party element to ticket, perhaps, if he's the nominee, Rubio is right there as a youthful representation of what's happening within the GOP. Right. And uh, what about I, Chris Christie, Matt? Would he, could he be a good number two for Romney? Kind of a Remember, Nixon was kind of a buttoned-up, Romney type, uh, stiff on the trail, but he got Spiro Agnew, who was a real rallier, 
uh, from Maryland, kind of a Christie personality, to be help combat the media in the number two slot for him. Absolutely, I think Christie. I mean, you know, I dismiss the talk. Of, you know, if Romney picks Rob Portman or Bob McDonald, it's going to be the most boring <laughs> pick ever. Um, I I think that Rubio and, and Christie are the top two. If, if, if you're selecting based on um, what they bring to the ticket, aside from delegates, might be part of some sort of Rand Paul deal. Um, and I think Christie would be an interesting choice, and I think he would be a good choice. I think, um, on one hand, it's sort of it's sort of taking a page from Bill Clinton, right? Everybody thinks you need to balance the ticket ge geographically and ideologically, and yet by picking Al Gore. Instead of balancing the ticket, Bill Clinton really doubled down on their brand, which was young, southern, sort of um, moderate, you know, Democrat. And I think, in a way, Romney would be doing the same thing, sort of doubling down on their brand in some ways, um, you know, regionally from the same sort of part of the Yeah, country. a Romney-Christie ticket could play real well in somewhere like the Philadelphia suburbs, more moderate. But still, exactly, yeah. but then on the other hand, I think if it would balance the ticket, I would say stylistically, um, that obviously Christie is is more you know, homespun, tough, um, authentic. And there's also something of the Christie story. I don't think it's enough attention. So he's a U.S. attorney, and he's going after corporations, not Bain, but corporations like Bain. Uh, and he's going after corporations who are corrupt. Not that Bain was corrupt, but my point is. Christie was someone who was holding corporations uh, to, to task, and he was going after them as a U.S. attorney. He was a tough prosecutor, and for someone who's uh, lampooned by Democrats as a, a corporate guy, Mitt Romney, <coughs> I think Chris Christie offers a lot in being bringing a different perspective, being still very pro-growth, very free market, but also being someone who said, "Look, I, I brought corporations to court who are trying to uh, uh, cause problems for consumers right. or, or cheat the system." And both these guys are fresh. I mean, you know, nobody knew who Marco Rubio or, or, or Chris Christie was five years ago. They're not sort of tainted by the Bush era. They're um, they're kind of up and coming. But they're both they both be great surrogates. I mean, Rubio in the sense of being very eloquent, having a great story, um, and being able to kind of persuade people through. You know, he can present a conservative vision. In, in a, it sort of goes back to what I was saying about what Santorum's not good at. Ruby is very good at sort of staying on message and presenting a conservative vision in a way that I think is very appealing to a broad variety of Americans. On the other hand, Christie, uh, much more you know pugilistic, uh, it might be great. It might be very good for Romney to have a guy he could send out there. Yeah. Christie can guy. go on Morning Joe like he did yesterday yeah. or, or a Today Show and really t yeah. get in little spars with reporters and, and push back, which is something Romney is just not good at doing. Yeah, and Christy, man, wouldn't you just love uh, in your own life to have be able to send Chris Christy and everyone's to <laughs> take somebody down? We could, we, we could all use our guardian Christy <laughs> to help us out. <laughs> so, what about so Susanna yeah, Martinez or Paul Ryan? Real quick. I, I think that uh, you got to take them seriously as well. Martinez, I don't know. Uh, she's, she's a prosecutor, too. Right, but I don't know if you said the national vetting. So That's like, true. She's not. Christy and Rubio have gone on. You know, Morning Joe and Meet the Press. We know how they handle adversity. Uh, Martinez, I think, is a rising star. I don't know if she's had to face that kind of scrutiny. Um, it's not. It's not like she's governor of Alaska, but still, she's she hasn't had the national exposure. Paul Ryan, um, a lot about him I like. I think the big downside, his sort of strength is also his weakness. The entitlement stuff would be very. You can see Obama, you know, demagoguing it. And, you know, you have Mitt Romney, who doesn't care about the very poor. Uh, it would be a very much a class warfare campaign, unfortunately. Hey, you're the editor, of course, Matt, of The Quotable Rogue, a great book. And so what's your take on what Palin's doing right now? Uh, she seems to be open to the idea of a broker convention. She's not taking herself out of the conversation. Uh, what, what do you think Palin's up to? Um, so I don't know the latest per se, but I will say this: when you know, in South Carolina, she right before South Carolina, she went on Fox and she didn't endorse Newt, but she said, "I would encourage people to vote for Newt to keep the conversation going, keep the vetting alive." And at the time, I thought, 
my first instinct was that's kind of like lame. I mean, if you're going to endorse Newt, endorse Newt. If you're not, yeah, I think Newt's really suffered by not having her on the trail with him. If she backs Newt, she should have backed Newt. Newt could have really used someone like Palin this past couple weeks. Oh, the past week, you very, you very well may be correct. But I'll say this: in South Carolina, I think that was the best thing she could have done for him because I think he sort of got all the benefit and none of the downside. And I think a lot of a lot of people in South Carolina asking them to like give a full-throated endorsement vote for Cambridge might have been a bridge too far, but asking them to do something a little bit less um, uh, involved, which is simply to keep the process going, I, I tend to think it might have worked. So what else is on your mind with Super Tuesday? So, uh, well, I wanted to talk, you know, uh, before we close out, I wanted to just yeah, sure. talk about Talk about you and what you're doing. Right, talk about um, me, please. <laughs> I want to talk about Toby Keith's song. No, you know, you mentioned earl- you mentioned earlier, you know, being on the trail. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm intrigued by um, by how people today cover politics because it's a, it's a 24 hour news cycle. You've got to, you know, you can't just write a column a day. You've got to be on Twitter. Or you've got to make a video. Um, and then, like, just the life on the road, which can be can be tough. Over, I mean, we've been at this now for a long time. Sure. How how do you how do you handle it, and are, are there struggles? I mean, to, just to give you the unvarnished truth about how it is on the campaign trail, it, it's very hectic. You, you live out of Holiday and Expresses and rental cars. Now, let me preface all this by saying it's a thrill. I get a kick out of it. I love it. Uh, but there's some funny things I've just noticed as I've been reporting on the presidential race from going to the Ames straw poll in the summer, way before that, covering Herman Cain and others. So one of the biggest things about the campaign trail, I'm always going to remember from this year, is that when you are trying to go around New Hampshire or around Iowa or drive from Columbia, South Carolina to Charleston, you're oftentimes having to blog, tweet, and do all this. And so a lot of people always wonder, well, how are you filing but going from Columbia to Charleston? How are you tweeting? And I think... Reporters are probably responsible for some of the worst driving in this country. <laughs> because I have mastered the technique, and this is not something probably to brag about, but it's just part of the process, of I have my tape recorder, and I tape it to my uh, steering wheel, and I'll put, put it on, and I'll put my ear set on, I'll put this, my phone on speakerphone, and I'll conduct multiple interviews while I'm driving, and just have it all recorded uh, on speakerphone in my car. You tape it? You literally tape it to the steering wheel? Yeah. Literally tape it. <laughs> so when you're driving, you have the recorder right there, and then you, you, you'll make the call, you'll, you'll put the phone down, you'll keep driving normally, and you'll just keep right. talking, but you end up and having meanwhile, a And by the way, this isn't like you driving home from work. I mean, no, this, this is in a car I don't own, <laughs> on roads I don't understand. <laughs> But this is how you do it, because so as you know, as a reporter, this, this, this tape may someday be used as evidence in a trial against. Him. I know this is this is this is bad, uh, but let me let me say I am a good driver. I try. I, I I don't. I'm always two hands on the wheel. But my point is is that reporters now are doing so much. You have to really find time. And in the old days, I'm sure you could have went from event to event and filed a story. But now you have to file a, an essay piece. So I'm always trying to collect thread collect audio that I can use as a, a paragraph here, a paragraph there. Oh, yeah, and then, and then the other thing, too, is, that, you know, it's not like there isn't scrutiny. I mean, if, if you mess something up, if you write something wrong, you spell something, you get someone's name wrong, you're an idiot, right? Right. Never mind the fact that you're, like, dealing with a lot of stuff. I think we all need, you know how, like, politicians have handlers, like drivers, <laughs> and Ezra, Ezra Klein has, like, three or four assistants. I think we, you know, bloggers and, and, and commentators, we need to have like a full-time assistant. Like, why, why does the Daily Caller and National Review not get this? <laughs> Look, uh, I'm first in line to, to have that fight. <laughs> to have an assistant, please, thank you. I, I would love one. I, I think, I, then again, I mean, let's be real. I think everyone in this country, regardless if you're a reporter, you're a teacher, I don't care what you do, business, uh, everyone could use an assistant. Yeah. Sure. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've got it easy. I know that. Well, I mean, our, our we, we are busy, though. You're right. It, it's right. become I mean, a, it's a, tw- it's a 24-7 job. And, and that's, yeah. that's the blessing of it. And it can also at times be a curse because people don't realize when you're out that like, you're not being rude when you're on a BlackBerry or your iPad. It's just oh, this yeah. is politics never stops. That's the thing, right? 
And oh, oh, let, let me just let me just use a classic example from this very show. So Bill Sher and I uh, normally do this show every week, and um, he wanted to do it, or we taped it at like um, three o'clock in the afternoon or four o'clock in the afternoon. So during business hours, during the work, day. and I got a little flack because a few weeks ago. I was, while Bill was talking, I would like ask Bill a question and he would talk and while I would listen to him and I was like responding to emails and unfortunately it made this like really annoying typing sound that, that was picked up and and I got a lot of flack in that people were like we were being disrespectful to Bill and I mean and, and I of course mean no disrespect at all but what they don't understand is we're taping this during business hours. Right. Now if I did a five minute MSNBC hit, I wouldn't have to be plugged in. But I can't talk to somebody for an hour right. with a computer in front of me during business hours. And in this case, I had, you know, Cudlow's producer emailing me saying, can you come on? I need to know in the next five minutes. <laughs> um, and then I need some talking before, you know, I mean, there's like stuff like that. Um, and I know I'm whining and bitching and complaining, but you deal with this. Stuff oh, yes, time. Matt. It will be you with the Cudlow hit. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Oh, my God. They won't be able but no, I mean, like, if I didn't get back, if, if somebody invites you to come on TV and they've got a boss and they're under pressure and they need to hear back, you sort of need to email them back. You can't, like, I'm not going to check email. No, you're hitting on a key point, right? A lot of people think journalism is kind of sit back and, 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 and rub your chin and write a, a story. It's a hustle business. It really is. you got to hustle. You, you want to survive. You want to compete. You better hustle. The best people in this business are people like you who are masters of Twitter, on TV constantly, but also writing insightful, well-reported articles. And that just doesn't happen. And I think, you know, it's fair for us to not, uh, not just, just, just be real about it, to say that's what happened. you got to hustle. You're doing a lot of things at once. And that's the fun of it. That's why we're in journalism, uh, because covering politics is a, is a great game. It's a, it's a, I get a kick out of it. It's, it's always it's always exciting. There are always new characters and personalities and hot stories and scoops. Uh, but you're right. At the same time, it, it keeps you it keeps you moving. It really does. Right. Well, and you're 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 very young, um, and, and you've been at National Review for I think you said two and a half years. But I mean, you. How, I guess my question is like, do you have any strategies for not burning out for for keeping the passion alive, so to speak? I mean. Because um, you can't just do day in and day out every day hustle. No, you can't. Um, you ha you have like, to have a balance. Yeah. You know, how do you how do you do that? I mean, one is I, I think the, the key is to recognize that you need to have a balance. I mean, I'm the far thing from a, a self help guru, but if if I was going to uh, advise to anybody who's trying to become a journalist, especially cover national politics, is that you just can't always be on. That you may feel like everyone else is always on, and you have to thus always be on. It's just not possible. Some of the best things I do on a personal level are just turning off my BlackBerry or at least putting it on uh, silent for email only so I get calls. And that's one of the best things is just not hearing the email sound on your BlackBerry or iPhone. And maybe going to watch a movie, or watching a favorite TV show, or going to hang out with friends. Uh, you, you, if you get in this mode where you're filing, 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 and then you file at 5 or 6, and then you start looking at the stories the next day, and then you're up at 5 or 6 the next morning, it can be. Uh, this is how people burn out. Yeah. Uh, friends of mine, I think, have struggled. You know, no names, of course, but I know friends of mine have struggled uh, with this constant deadline pressure. And it's not even about the deadline per se. A lot of people think, oh, it's tough to meet a deadline. It's it's the amount of deadlines. I think, especially for people who work for daily newspapers, it's a little different national review in the Daily Caller, where we don't have strict newspaper deadlines or publication deadlines. Uh, but when you work at these major news groups and they're expecting you to blog, report. Uh, it's tough, and, and I think a lot of these, a lot of people just forget that you have to be honest, not only to yourself but to your your higher ups, that you need some time to balance. And that, uh, I mean, it comes down to simple things. There's no secret to this. If I'm going to cover a campaign on the trail, I'm there. I'm 100 percent there. I'll work seven days a week, and you got to do that because if you're on the trail, you got to live it, breathe it, smell it. But when you're back in D.C. if it's a quiet lull period, don't work on the weekends. I mean, you just got you got to turn it off. And some of, the, some of the best bloggers in this business, you'll notice, they don't blog on the weekends. Because yeah, even one of the things, one of the things that I found myself doing, it's like a psychological thing, is you know I have a list, a uh, Twitter list. By the way, people should follow this. It's really good. I've, I've cataloged and, and uh, um, sort of assembled a, a list of top political journalists on Twitter. 
and there were like a couple hundred of them. Um, and I think you're on the list. You're not, you, you Maybe know, one day I'll make the list. I think you're on the list. I should double check. You're like the guy at the door at the club. I, I think you're on the list. I don't see it. <laughs> if you're not, it's an oversight. Oh, well, thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> but and I'm pretty sure you are. Right. But anyway, so um, but what, what I'll do is like I'll look through that list, and if Jonathan Martin has a story, or Ben Smith, or Dave Weigel, or Rich Lowry, uh, or Catherine Lopez, or you, or whomever, I will be like, or McKay Coppins, why didn't I get that story? And I will judge myself. There might be a hundred people on that list. I will judge myself like against the. Well, that's unfair. That's unfair to yourself. You're gonna. Yeah, because like there are 99 other people on that list who are. And great. they have a lot of other people working with them a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, it, and there are 99 other people who didn't get the story either. Well, I think you're hitting on something that a lot of journalists fall victim to. You cannot think of yourself constantly as competing. One of the best things I realized early on, even though I realized this as a college journalist, is that I love good writing. I love good television, and and so appreciate it. I'm not in competition. If I see something good, I'll tweet it out. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll praise people. Because I, I think the, one of the worst things about journalism is sometimes it gets a little too ruthless with, with it between journalists. And it's such a small world that why have such a, a competition? And I, I, I think journalists shouldn't worry so much about, oh, someone got that scoop on Twitter. I didn't get that story. Rather than, oh, that's an interesting scoop. Thumbs up. How can I build in that story? What else is out there? Uh, it, 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 I mean, to get your own work done, it's enough of a trial most days. So to worry about others, yeah. I mean, I know this is just like, it's probably just going too much into generalities, but if you worry too much about what others are doing, especially in journalism, you're not focusing enough then on your own reporting and your own calls. I think you're totally right, and I think this is also a key to mental health, and it's karma, and I, I think, honestly, it's like, if, if you... Um, I mean, it's one thing to have a healthy competition to always want to be the best. I mean, it's conservative in a sense, uh, free market. But on the other hand, I mean, you should. Be, if someone else gets a good story, then you should help promote that story, retweet it. And the odds, not only is that the right thing to do, but then they're probably more likely to retweet something you do down the road too. You can have these, you know, mutually beneficial win-win uh, relationships. Yeah, I think. Sometimes Twitter is, is perfect. It's, it's great with debates and see what everyone else is saying. But sometimes the best thing is to get off Twitter a little bit and just make some phone calls. Some of the yeah. best phone calls I have are stuff I can't even use, you know, off the record from the campaign advisors or just stuff that's not really relevant to put online, but it just gives you so much deep historical knowledge in different contexts. Because if you're relaxed and you've gotten a good sleep and you're not bugged out by Twitter, you can produce some good journalism. I think anyone can, and I think that's yeah. the real the real well, draw. Twitter is. I think Twitter is seductive, and it is simultaneously a great tool that that can be utilized, and it can also drive you insane. And I think the same thing about TV. Being worried about getting on TV uh, can, can be narcissistic, and it can drive you insane. I see people who get paranoid. Someone else is on, and they're not on, and it's like. No, I think the key thing about I've that done a few TV hits, and I think um, maybe that TV is the one thing I do. So I almost I almost write it on my hand is relax, because I feel like the viewers are not trying to judge you in the sense that oh did he get that analysis pointed? Did he get that pointed about the poll? Most the best things I've ever gotten from people who've seen a, a, something I've done on a television hit is you say oh you look relaxed and comfortable. At that because I think if you get so worried, you got to almost toss away your nose before you go on TV. And in terms of the competition for TV hits, I mean, it comes back to the free market. I guess everyone's competing. Uh, but, I mean, the thing about cable television, I think you feel this as well, is that there's, they're oftentimes just trying to fill in time. I mean, they're, they're, they have a lot of gaps, and if you're not on, you're not on. I mean, it's not, it's not a big deal. And TV it has great uh, effect in helping you get out there with your, your name. And, and your your so-called uh, reputation as a commentator, but in terms of shaping the political debate, almost nothing that happens on television is newsy in terms of pundit stuff, unless someone makes a mistake or a gaffe. Right. Excellent. Well, this is a fun conversation. We talked. Uh, we talked. You know, political uh, timely political analysis, and then a little uh, insider navel gazing, which I which I enjoy doing. And, uh, but awesome talking with you. And, and for those who want to keep up, how, how should they uh, keep up with you on, on Twitter at National Review? Uh, on Twitter, I'm Robert Costa, N-R-O, 
and uh, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, and then on nationreview.com, uh, the corner blog is where I'm often blogging. I also have articles on nationreview.com. Of course, the magazine um, on my CNBC uh, once in a while, uh, do Larry Kudlow's show, uh, do some MSNBC. Um, and so that's about it. Um, if you, I'm also always looking for story ideas, so if anyone ever wants to drop an email, it's, my email is public, rcosta at nationalreview.com. Always looking for tips or, or criticisms, bring them on. <laughs> Matt, what about you? I mean, you're the senior writer at Daily Caller. Um, yeah, well, send, send the criticisms to uh, rcosta. <laughs> um, okay. No, Matt, uh, at, Matt K, at Matt K. Lewis on Twitter. And uh, I'm on most of, most of the social media. But, oh, I, I will plug. I never do. Um, I will plug MattKLewis.com, my own personal little website. And then, uh, what else? Oh, the Matt Lewis podcast. We oh, just that's great. Yeah, you've had some great interviews in that podcast. Yeah, you know what? I want you to come on the podcast. Well, Can we make that happen? Well, well, you'll have to talk to my, my assistant. You're your people, okay. <laughs> well, we just said I'm going to do that. We just had we should. I'm going to keep this conversation going. We just had McKay Coppins on, uh, talking about that that uh, Marco Rubio Mormon story. And so it's Matt Lewis show, Matt Lewis in the news, whatever. Uh, you can find it on iTunes or at mattklewis.com. Check it out. Sounds good. Talk to you soon, Matt. Thanks. For All right. Thanks. See ya. See ya.